Hello, I'm so thrilled to have you here with me today for my presentation, Transforming Social Media Time into Learning Time. It's a tall task, uh, and I'm really excited to share with you a little bit of how I've been doing that uh, in my career. So I'd like to start uh, at this intersection um, between education and social media. Uh, this is where I hang out. This is what I think about all the time. This is what this presentation is about. And right now, I believe that education is often looking at social media like this. Uh, we're in this constant posture of being afraid of what our students are doing on social media. And if they, if it ever comes up, it's usually because someone has done something stupid or, or uh, ignorant. Uh, and we often discipline that kid and go back to this uh, posture of not caring what our students are doing on social media. And I think that's a big problem. I think social media represents a tremendous opportunity for our students and for teaching and learning, uh, and specifically for, for what schools do really well, which is you know, character education and, and lifelong learning. Um, and so how do we get social media? How do we bring it into our curriculum? How do we bring it into our classrooms um, if currently this is our posture? Well, I think in the heady early days of the 2010s, um, we believed that the answer to this question, social media helps create more informed citizens, political participation, equitable economic opportunities, understanding of other cultures, or all of the above. We believed that the answer was E, all of the above. Um, but actually, uh, I think that now in the last you know, five plus years, we've actually started to say, well, hold on a second. Um, are we really more informed with the rise of you know, fake news and anti-vaxxers um, and QAnon, right? Like, probably not. Um, are we really more more politically participating more politically more? Uh, maybe uh, potentially. Um, I, I think there's an argument against that one as well. Do we have more equitable economic opportunity? I, I don't think so. The, the rise of uh, of mergers and acquisitions is way up, and and the starting of small businesses is down. Perhaps the pandemic uh, uh, might change that. Uh, and also the income inequality is just drastic in our society. And then D, understanding of other cultures. Uh, I don't think we can say we're doing better with that, even though social media should open our world up to other cultures. You know, look no further than the, you know, build the wall and the, the Muslim ban uh, and, and the problems that we're having in, in our country. So actually, I believe that this answer is E, none of the above. But I also believe that it should be E, all of the above. If we're teaching this right, and if we get our students in these spaces with the right direction and the right mentorship, uh, this will be e, all of the above. And the last slide, we will stop being so scared of social media and we'll actually be able to start embrace it as something that can fulfill our mission if we do it correctly. Um, so that's my goal. Uh, this is a thesis uh, at the, the 30,000 foot level. I think that currently our, our information system is broken uh, and that's thanks in large part to social media. And that if we don't fix it, um, we are creating an epistemic inequality in our society um, that sort of has two functions. One is the way in which that technology knows about us is inequitable, but also how we come to know, and this is the important one, how we come to know in technolo technological spaces uh, is inequitable um, and it's causing a, an epistemic crisis. I know that's not exactly the, the best thing to want to hear in, in this session. I think it does a good job of framing a real problem that we need to address. Uh, so in, in my green bullets here, I, I would say we can and must take this on. And, and that should be through uh, uh, the current structures we have, which is digital citizenship, media alert, literacy, and digital portfolios. Uh, and those things, in order to do those things right, we have to be doing this on social media. We have to be teaching on social media. So as I, as I say at the bottom, to stimulate lifelong learning, we need to help students build personalized learning networks based on passions, whether that's academic, civic, or professional. If we want to fix the problems of how our kids are using social media, if we want uh, to make it a space of learning, we want to close this epistemic gap. Uh, we have to open up these spaces um, to things that our students love, things that they love to do, whether that's in the classroom, extracurriculars, uh, or, or, or in society at large. Um, that is the only way. You have to be on social media, one, and two, you have to let them uh, follow passions of theirs uh, if we're going to succeed in this space. And because we haven't done that yet, we have not seen success, which is what has led to some of the problems I was talking about previously. So <clears throat> what I would ask you here today, if we were in person, I would ask this as, a, as an activity. 
what do we as a school, uh, as a student body, as a teacher, as a classroom do uh, when we have a student, uh, for example, share a, a Me Too story on, on Instagram? Or we have a Muslim student share her fear after Trump enacts his Muslim ban. Or we have a student posting uh, vaccine hesitancy on, on Snapchat. Again, I, I think right, what we're doing now is, is we're, we're pretending like we don't see these things and not acting upon these things. And it's only making this stuff worse. Uh, we're, we're, we're allowing students to dictate how these conversations go completely outside of our purview, outside of our mentorship, outside of our leadership. Uh, and, and as a result, uh, this is only widening that epistemic gap uh, between those who agree with each other and interact with each other in, in these social media spaces uh, and not the, the uh, cohesive, collective citizenship route that often we would, we would work on these things in a school setting. Um, so that's what I'm worried about. And, and that, that gets me a little bit into what I want to talk about next, which is these mediums within which our students are having these conversations are not built. They're not designed uh, for this kind of education, for the citizenship, for the connection, uh, for the community building, for the things that our schools, when they're operating really well, those things, the things that our schools need. Uh, um, social media is not helping us do that. Uh, in fact, it's making us much worse. Um, algorithms and social media spaces that try to keep us online in them to sell advertise, steal our data and sell advertising. Those spaces uh, are driving polarization, uh, misinformation, fear, angry, promoting zero-sum games, stoking outrage, sowing division. Um, and we've seen this with the way that our media has polarized, uh, which is a, there's, a, there's a graph behind this slide from the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard of where our media, where our media how they talk to each other. Uh, and you can see that our center and our left are talking to each other and our right is talking to itself um, on, in, in our current uh, media landscape on social media platforms. And what we also know about these platforms is what enrages engages. Um, and what we also know is that, you know, uh, 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 taking someone's words out of context, uh, uh, making a meme that attacks someone, taking someone at their worst moment and, and attacking them seems to be a, a, a popular discourse that gets promoted by these spaces. So how are we going to have a complex conversation about uh, America's uh, a problem with uh, um, these systemic issues with with our Muslim citizens, as as I was talking about in that previous slide, um, if it happens in these spaces. So the the way one way to put it is we're having uh, uh, complex conversations in, in spaces that don't accept nuance, empathy, citizenship, humanity, uh, uh, consensus, focus, complexity. Uh, all, all of these things we're losing uh, in these social media spaces. Uh, especially when we're trying to have tough conversations and complex conversations. Um, and so if one of the great things about schools and education is that we can gather together in a classroom and talk about something that's complex and really dig into it and, and unpack it. Um, if we can't do that in, in social media, and yet that's where these conversations are happening, uh, we're doing a whole generation of students a, a disservice uh, by allowing them to have these tough conversations and spaces that uh, don't value uh, uh, your humanity or the complexities involved in a tough topic um, and, and certainly don't even try to build consensus. In fact, their business models work away from consensus. Um, so uh, again, this is a great, a great challenge and one that, one that I want to talk, talk about how I think we can solve this today. Uh, but just a, a little longer, let's talk specifically about our, our, our users, our, our students. Um, you know, no matter what the survey is over the last 10 years, um, we have um, the numbers of who's using their phones or, or screens and screen time is going up more and more and more every single year. Um, so whether that's, you know, daily hours spent with digital media per adult, you know, uh, you can just see it going up, 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 up. Whether that's, you know, e-marketers research that says we're spending uh, 12 hours and nine minutes on all of these mediums per day, which is just crazy. Or you look at, you know, Nielsen's data that we're spending 11 hours and six minutes per day. You're like, how can we spend so long on media? Well, if we're multitasking, which we almost always are when we're on media because we have multiple devices, um, that sort of is double counting. So we can actually spend uh, uh, crazy, crazy high numbers of time on screens every day. 
Um, and I think we're seeing this with our students too. There's no doubt um, if you're teaching and working at a school, you're seeing your kids are spending more and more time online. And what I'd like to point out is specifically there, there, there can be great positives to that. Um, I just don't think that we've sort of captured that and steered our kids towards those great positives. And so how, would I, or how would I, I would articulate that is to say that, you know, in, in Common Sense Media's most recent study, um, they said that creating content, which I think is a very valuable and amazing things about these devices that we use in our schools, creating content, being creative, making something uh, and sharing it accounts for only 3% uh, of, our, of our teenagers' screen time. Um, and that, you know, when you, when you uh, multiply it out by the amount of screen time is about 13 minutes, uh, which is very, very small uh, considering the tremendous power and uh, uh, what, what you can do in these spaces. So I was talking previously uh, about why they're spending so much time in these spaces. And uh, it's simple. I mean, the companies, the, you know, the, whether it's the gaming companies or the social media companies or whatever, uh, the way in which they're making money uh, is by hooking you with variable rewards, which is the little one above your messages app to make you click on it. Or it's the slot machine style uh, of refresh, um, which, you know, variable rewards, it could, you could get something really, really amazing. You could get something really great. Um, you do that to hook a user to get a user on, and then you mine data and information and try to learn as much as you can about this user. And then you use that information to serve up that, to that user what they need to stay in your, in your app on your game for as long as they can so you can make as much money off of that user. Um, these companies are using psychological tricks, as Tristan Harris says. They're, they're traveling down the brainstem to do whatever they can to keep our hit, kids hooked. Um, and they're doing a, a great job of that, as, as I was saying previously in the, in the fact that, you know, our numbers just go up and up and up every year with how long our, our kids are spending online. Um, so with that, as, as the challenges that we face, um, you know, the, the, that, that moves me into sort of, OK, well, well, what are we doing now and what should we be doing? Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop with the pessimistic downer, like <laughs> this is where we are, and, and I'll, I'll get into some solutions. So first, let me talk about where, <clears throat> where I think most schools are, where we've sort of gotten to <clears throat> over the last like three or four years, realizing that this is a problem and we should address it. So I've been teaching a lot of digital citizenship and media literacy. We've added that to a lot of our curriculums. Unfortunately, I think that one of the problems we're having there is often our digital citizenship curriculum looks like this. Should you post blank? You know, or, or how does this post make that person feel? We might be talking about intent and impact a little bit. I think that's great, but I don't think that's enough. And then similarly with media literacy, we're often saying, hey, is this a good source on a research paper that you're turning in? So we're sort of retrofitting these new issues. Um, citizenship, now it's in the digital world. How do we add that to our curriculum? And then literacy and how does that fit in the, in the digital world? And we're sort of retrofitting that into the current curriculum. And the interesting thing about this, and I think, I think that's valuable. I think, I think we should continue doing that. I just think we need to do more. Um, however, uh, um, what I found really fascinating about teaching these things and, and watching schools and educators across the country do the same is that in a lab, in lab conditions, you know, in the classroom, when you ask these questions, my students always get it right. Just always. If you're like, hey, you know, Johnny, should you post that thing? Hey, you know, Abdul, is this a good source that you're using on your essay? They know. You know, they can start thinking, oh, maybe I shouldn't have posted that, or, or maybe this is something that wouldn't reflect positively on me, or, you know, maybe that source was, was probably not filled with the best information and I should have spent some more time researching and evaluating. Like, they get this right in a classroom or in the, in the lab, um, but then not in the real world. And so do we as teachers. You know, teachers act like good citizens. And then there's always a story every other week of a teacher doing something or saying something stupid online. Um, same thing with media literacy. You know, there, there, were, there were teachers, you know, at the Stop the Steal rally or, or, or insurrection at the Capitol on January 6th. Um, so, you know, we, we, we like to teach it, but, you know, we always we make these mistakes, too. But in a lab, when you take it outside of um, the, the digital realm and teach it in the classroom, they tend to get it right. Um, so how do we ingrain that so when they're getting it right in the classroom, they just get it right on their own online? And I think the only way to do that is to actually get into these spaces and actually get into social media and help kids find a different way and see a different way of using it so that they're not always uh, uh, using it for, for reasons of you know, social connection or, or, or confirmation bias or whatever might lead them astray when it comes to digital citizenship and media literacy. Uh, and then finally, another thing I, I want to talk about today is digital portfolios. 
almost all of them have a digital footprint already. Um, and actually, there's a fascinating stat that almost a quarter of children begin their digital lives when their parents upload a sonogram to the internet. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the numbers are, 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 are wild for just how many of our kids, just, even just by joining our schools, you know, they almost have to be using certain things and doing certain things online, which make, give them a digital footprint. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but as schools, we need to help our students take that digital footprint and blossom, make it blossom into a beautiful digital portfolio that will benefit them uh, when colleges might Google them or employers or, or what have you, that, that we need to get them thinking about curating a digital image way sooner, uh, way more intentionally, way more strategically. Uh, and again, it can't be a one-off, teach it once in a, in a sort of lesson and during, during free time about getting a job someday or getting into college and having to scrub your social media accounts. It's just not enough. Um, the only way to get this right again is to get into this space. Um, so how do we do that? Um, I'm, I want to talk about what, my view of these three topics, digital citizenship, media literacy, and digital portfolios, and then how I think uh, we can make a transformative difference in this space. Um, yeah. First, digital citizenship. I view digital citizenship as what's happening on the left side of this slide. When you get online, do you get online as an active informed citizen or a passive entertained consumer? To me, um, it's a state of mind. So when you're whipping out your phone to just endlessly scroll, you're probably getting in that space, whether it's logging in Instagram or TikTok or whatever it is, you're getting in that space as a passive entertained consumer. Um, and that's not gonna yield great outcomes for character education and lifelong learning because of that digital citizen, that, that state of citizenship, that state of mind when you get online. Now, do you always have to get online as an active, informed citizen, ready to learn and develop as a, as a citizen? No, uh, uh, there should be a little bit of both. Uh, but I think, unfortunately, right now for, for our students and, and for, for adults, too, that, that we are often on that passive, entertained consumer side rather than that active, informed citizen side. You know, so how do we get students to that active, informed citizen side? That's where I'm going next. Um, so another way to think of that as a framework is we need to be helping our kids talk about what they should do online, getting online as an active, informed citizen, learning, developing, all those things, rather than what they shouldn't do online. Don't watch Netflix. Don't play that video game. So this is sort of the, the framework that I would, how I would think about teaching this. So the next one would be media literacy. Um, and this is a, a, a funky graphic I use to think about it. What I believe that we should be doing with media literacy is we should have students um, getting online as first as active informed citizens, as that sort of critical thinker. And then they need to build these networks much bigger because what's happening is all of us, teenagers, adults, everything in our network, we have some nefarious elements, some evil elements, some Russian propaganda, and some liars. Um, and the only way to eliminate some of those negative, nefarious, evil elements is to make sure that our networks are big enough and filled with enough quality information that we can drown out uh, uh, or fact check uh, or, 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 or make less desirable and less likely to be clicked or commented on uh, the nefarious, evil, uh, lying elements. Um, so that's our charge is to build these networks bigger. But specifically, how do we build them bigger is what we need to be doing is we need to be building these networks bigger with groups of, of critical thinkers or, or, or organizations that put out quality content and experts. And again, the only way, as I've been saying throughout this presentation, the only way to succeed in this area is if a kid truly gets to learn about or follow uh, or create a network of something that they love. So if, this, if it's a student that likes you know, politics, for say, maybe, maybe a group of critical thinkers is the New York Times and an expert uh, is a pundit they like or a politician that they like. Sure, that, you know, that would be an example of learning from, from quality sources. Maybe some think tanks, uh, maybe some data firms, uh, polling firms. It, you know, all of a sudden, this, this student who's interested in this has a whole network that's putting out quality information uh, around an area of interest so that they're not getting duped uh, by propaganda or falling for, for confirmation you know, whatever they, they whatever they, they Google to, to confirm their biases. Um, and this could be anything, you know, that could be psychology, that could be law. Um, you know, there, there's professors and, and beat writers on, on everything uh, that could deliver quality information about whatever it is a student might be interested in. So again, we have to meet them where they are with what they're interested in, but we have to mentor them in this space so that they develop these bigger networks that is filled with quality information um, that will make it so when they're getting online, um, they're learning from and observing, uh, 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 you know, upstanding uh, uh, professionals in these spaces. 
Um, and so that, you know, in, in, in my framework would be uh, they need to value veracity over virality. Um, because right now in social media spaces, being social, often what you're coming across is things that are viral and things that are funny or, or things that, you know, have a, have a, a ton of likes, um, things that are engage, engaging. And as I said previously, sometimes that's things that enrage. Um, so how do we get kids to value veracity over virality? Again, it has to be an area of interest to them. And we have to build out these bigger networks so that they get good information and lots of it uh, that can get them sort of excited about and learning about and invested in um, their feed uh, that promotes veracity and, and not virality. So how do we do that? What, well, again, we have to find areas of interest for them. That could be anything from something that they like academically, something they're interested in civically, or something they might be interested in professionally. And as teachers and as mentors, we ha know what our kids are interested in. We know what they like. We know what they're doing. So we have to step in as mentors to help them build these networks. Uh, we certainly can find the time to do that in our classrooms, in our clubs, uh, in, in those times in between, in between programs uh, that we all have in our schools with different schedules. Um, so one of these areas, all of our students have one in, an interest in one of these areas for sure. Um, we just help, have to help them build a network and investigate that and learn about that uh, uh, to open and unlock uh, this different style of using social media uh, for good, for, for, for uh, uh, civic engagement, uh, for character education, uh, for learning and for professional opportunity. So that brings me to digital portfolios. And this was a, a digital portfolio from one of my students who uh, took a class with me called Mass Media and fell in love with our film unit uh, and then built this amazing website where he now is out of college applying for jobs and he can say confidently, I've been studying filmmakers and learning about this stuff for, for <laughs> many years now <laughs> since I took you know, Mass Media as a junior in high school. Uh, um, and I'm ready to enter this field and I can show off my amazing work. Um, so... Uh, when an employer looks um, at, at this, this kid's work, um, it's, pr it's, it's clear he hasn't been studying this stuff. He knows the lingo. Uh, he's tried a bunch of things, and, and he's a much more desirable candidate than someone who just has, you know, let's say, a, f a film major on their, their resume without the digital portfolio to go with it. So uh, in that mass media class, I also had a couple other students that wanted to go into the, that really loved our journalism unit, and they wanted to be writers. And, you know, they did the same thing. And this is their digital portfolios. What I wrote on this is that when an employer sees these things, immediately they show, they see effort, initiative, creativity, professionalism, ambition, leadership, intellectual curiosity, problem solving, perseverance, commitment, self-expression, and challenge. So that digital portfolio is just a differentiator uh, for our students that know what they're interested in, have been studying it, and, and can show off uh, their interest uh, and their expertise uh, when they're ready uh, uh, to enter professional spaces. And this digital portfolio will, will unlock those spaces for them. So that would be, uh, you know, number three, uh, digital portfolios and, and the concept of create over spectate. Uh, and that echoes back to what I was saying previously about that common sense media study that found that, found that our kids were only creating with 3% of their online time. Uh, we need to get that number up. Doesn't have to be 100%, uh, but, but we need to get that number up. And that was what, that's what digital portfolios will help us do that. So, that brings me to my last section here, which is, well, how do we do all of these things that I'm talking about? Um, and I have a ton, a ton of examples coming for you here. Um, and I think if, if we're trying to help our kids find passions and develop networks and learn online, um, where as schools and as teachers can we find the spaces um, to help teach what, what I'm talking about now? And I think it should be an all of the above approach. It should be in our classrooms. It should be in our extracurriculars. Uh, um, and it should be in our, in our you know, uh, flex times when we're trying to talk about you know, careers or, or citizenship or whatever it may be. Um, so anytime we can find to work on, on these things, uh, we absolutely have to take it. And, and, I'll, and I'll show you some examples. So first, let me talk about um, that mass media class that I showed you those digital portfolios from. Um, I started this class with a Twitter list. And I said, if, you're, if you want to go into a career um, connected to media, here's hundreds of people that you can follow that are in these careers that are doing amazing work that you can learn from. So that's that media literacy, building up their networks so they can learn from quality organizations and thinkers in this space. And then I said, well, if you're going to go into media, you have to be able to write. You have to be able to, to write an, uh, an article. So I created a blog and had them practice that skill. And this was part of that digital portfolios thing. 
And then I said, well, you don't have to be able to cross medium. So here's an Instagram account. You can learn how to how to do uh, social media, PR, uh, um, um, you know, photography, things that you're going to need if you want to go into media and so on and so forth. We did that with a Twitter account, too. And we did that with a SoundCloud account so they could put podcasts on there. So I made them cross mediums as well. And we sort of concluded with film, as I was talking about with my student, my student earlier that I was showing. So that is one way in the classroom to say in every unit I taught in mass media, I connected it to what professionals are doing in that space. And I created the space for me to say to a student, if this is what you really like about this class, if this is what excites you, well, here's a, here's a professional network that can make you really good at it. Here's some more examples of my students and what they came up with there. I had this one kid who was fascinated by uh, a horror, the horror as a genre. And so he made a whole blog and got really invested in different types of horror video games and films and, and wrote all about it. And then the same kid actually found out that um, he then he said, well, actually, you know, I want to do I want to do film reviews more, more broadly, uh, uh, more blockbusters. And so here this is from a few years ago. This was him doing reviews of, of Hollywood films. And then finally, he realized that actually filmmakers were gathering on this new social media app called Letterboxd, where you show all the films you've watched and, and you can write thoughts on them and, and make, connect with others. And now he's had a social network for his own passion about film. Um, so that's one example of a student that came out of one of my classes, mass media, and then beyond my class was, was doing work that we were doing in class, blogging, making videos, um, and to eventually found a professional network outside of something I even knew about. I didn't even know what Letterboxd was. Um, to continue learning from professionals and getting better at something that he, you know, took a liking in in my class. So I know mass media is a, is a, is a nice course, is a broad course to do something like that in, but I've also done that in my history classes. I'm a history teacher. Um, so for example, I taught a contemporary world history class and I did the same thing. I said, well, here's a list. If we want to know what's going on in the world, if that's the goal of this course, you know, here's a list of a, of a ton of uh, um, journalists and, and think tanks and, and, and organizations and international development, international business, and you know a, a, uh, NGOs and you know nonprofits and all these types of organizations that are doing great work in the international community. Here's what you should be learning from. Uh, and then we would spend some time in class looking through this Twitter feed, seeing what was going on in the world, talking about it. Uh, and then I said to the students, well, here's the types of things that are going to come up in a class like this. Uh, uh, human rights, education, literacy, healthcare, um, you know, crime, you know, technology, nutrition, et cetera, et cetera. I said, you tell me from this list of things that we're going to come across what you're interested in. And then when we come across it in, in this amazing list, this amazing network we built, uh, and we find amazing, we have find interesting and, and quality information around these areas of interest. I'll just click one of these columns and send you the stuff that comes up and, and you can decide if this is truly an interest for you uh, and learn about it and decide if, if this is something you want to continue to learn about and a network you want to build bigger and get more invested in, or maybe this is not for you. And, and I think for any teacher, no matter what subject you're teaching, I think you can do something like this and you're not going to reach all of your kids and that's totally fine. But if you can reach just a few that have a passion for your subject matter, um, you're setting them up for, for tremendous success uh, where they will be learning about this subject matter indefinitely beyond your class in a space that updates in real time with quality information, which I think is incredibly powerful. Um, so here's how one of my uh, science teachers did something similar. Um, he said that, you know, you know, he set, set them up for projects that they were working on. And then he said, well, you know, if you're working on this project, you should probably check this out. And if you want to keep up with what's going on in this area of, of interest, you should check this out. And he said, at the end of this unit, you're going to have to do a poster presentation. And here are examples of scientists doing these poster presentations that um, what you know you will have to do at the end of this unit in order to show what you've learned. And then sure enough, you know, they did their poster presentation and, and he, he presented it. So whether it's on an individual level, uh, or a class level, uh, I believe, getting into these social media spaces and allowing our students to not only see how it works, but, but also participate in it uh, uh, can set them up for success and to see social media differently so they can develop citizenship, literacy, uh, and professional opportunity um, with our help. So I asked I had a student who was interested and in, he wanted to be on ESPN someday, wanted to be a commentator. I said, well, well, why don't you create your own version of that here? And this would be an extracurricular activity. And he, he cut highlight tapes together from all of our athletic teams. And then he would, you know, comment on them as if he was an ESPN broadcaster. And he made a little YouTube page and started to uh, share these and, and show, if, show that he was good at this. Uh, and, sh you know, should that be something he pursues uh, later in life, he can point to 
where he started and where he sort of cut his teeth and, and got better at it every day and how he learned how to edit and how he learned how to, uh, um, you know, time his his calls and all that, um, which is, you know, an extracurricular activity, boom, uh, connected to social media. Uh, inevitably as well, he was following and, and learning from, from the experts. And this is a, uh, another one that had a student who's interested in, in stopping animal cruelty. Uh, again, I helped I helped her build a network. This is uh, uh, from from one of my classes, and and I, I you know allowed this to be one of her her final project. And I said, okay, well, you know, if you want to, uh, if this is one of your areas of interest, how do you, you know, spread the word, and how do you how do you uh, help others learn from good sources and quality information about stopping animal cruelty and how you do that? And so she built the whole website on that. Um, again, should she go into this? She has a network and she has a she has a, uh, a digital portfolio that shows that she's been studying this for a while now, uh, and I hope it benefits her later in life. Uh, anyway, and I eventually created what I'm what I'm talking about now into my own course that I call Passion Based Learning Through Social Media, and in that course, a student gets to pick one of their passions and, and use social media to learn about it in the same way that that I've been describing. So this is one of my stu my students who is interested in photography and 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 uh, nature and poems, and she was like, "Well, I'll, I'll put together a little like a digital resume, if you will, of of how I've been, you know, some of the trips I've been on, the photography I've taken, and the poetry that I've written as a sort of a place to to aggregate all of that and show my intellectual curiosity, my artistic side, um, etc." Um, so sometimes it, the students that come to me with that passion and that interest, um, and all I do is help them. Uh, Help guide them to other places where there are, you know, photographers doing doing amazing work, or or you know, poets that are that are you know every day talking about the poetry they're writing or sharing it online. Um, so this amazing glimpse into the professional world that um, most of our students aren't accessing that that now this particular kid was accessing. I had a kid who also wanted to learn more about marketing. Um, she was like, "We don't have a marketing class at, at this school," and I was like, "That's okay. You can learn about this online." Um, and so she she did so, and, and actually, as you can see from from this website, um, she actually tried to sort of make it so that she could teach others the way that she had learned about marketing. If you wanted to learn about marketing as a teenager before before you get to college, uh, which I thought was tremendous, and it was sort of a you know and you know again a way to aggregate great resources and great information and then share it with others who also might want to follow this path, who didn't want to wait until college in order to do that. This is how my course works. You, I have a, a series of skills that I have them do. So the content is truly theirs. Um, and what I'm doing is I'm teaching them how to sort of uh, learn online, curate, create, share, collaborate, uh, and, and lead. And I, I allow them a wide variety of how to do that. Um, but of course, that uh, it has to come from something they care about and they're interested in and that they want to get good at. Um, and one of these I want to highlight is actually that collaborate section. Because in that collaborate section, I ask students to say, well, if you have this professional network and there are all these amazing people doing amazing things, why don't you connect with one of them? One of the huge advantages of social media is you can just reach out to these professionals and they'll hit you back. Um, and I've had tremendous success in this class with students uh, reaching out to, to professionals, whether it was the student who was interested in animal cruelty, reaching out to the uh, to PETA and getting an interview from them and being able to talk to them and, and write up the work that she did with them. Or I had another kid who was interested in helping um, girls have opportunities in coding, a girls in STEM project, who connect, who reached out to someone who wrote a book that she was reading about it, the topic, and someone who was placing coders into the professional world. She was able to talk to both of those people and, again, write it up and learn from them and add them to their network. So I'll just end with this. Um, if you find this way of uh, what, you know learning through social media and getting our students invested in social media spaces so they can be quality citizens learning great information and, and creating professional opportunities. I said the first thing I would ask teachers to do um, is this activity where I say, well, what would that additional section of your syllabus be that has this tremendous network uh, of, of uh, professionals and, and the authors of your readings, uh, journals and periodicals that connect to your, to your content? And if you had a kid that really, really loved your class, um, could they learn about this topic? Um, in a space that delivers quality information that updates in real time and provides you this window into the professional world and an opportunity to collaborate with professionals and show off, show proof of work, uh, show that this is an area you're interested in and you're, you're doing good work in. And that could be simply responding to a post or that could be posting something original yourself or anything in between. Uh, um, and and I, think, I think that we would find that, of course, as teachers, we wouldn't reach everyone. 
But if each one of us is reaching a few kids and helping them create uh, an amazing network, uh, then before you know it, we'll have a whole school of kids and a whole generation of kids that have seen uh, the power of social media to learn about a passion, to get better at something you love, and to portray yourself uh, um, in a space where you're understood um, as a learner and a creator and a sharer and an aggregator, uh, a collaborator in a space uh, of something that you love. Um, so I think we can do that. I, I think um, I believe in it so much that I tried to start this myself. So I built the website that I call Social Media Marketplace, where I tried to tell students, if you're interested in this topic, whether it's law or technology or data or whatever, here are things that, that my website will then spit back to you. Twitter accounts, Facebook accounts, YouTube accounts, podcasts, etc. That would help you learn more about this area of interest so you can truly see if this is something that you think you're interested in or if this is something you actually want to pursue. And so we've never had access. We've never had such amazing opportunity to see, to learn whatever we want to learn, whenever we want to learn, uh, to see what professionals in every different industry are doing, where they're sharing their day to day, they're sharing their work um, in these spaces. We've never had this tremendous opportunity ever before. Uh, and as schools, for the most part, we're, we're punting on this and we're not even getting in the space. We're not even taking advantage of this or we are doing it in very limited uh, um, uh, things that have been taken offline that are taught in, in a classroom, in a lab, and not something that's, that's truly applicable uh, and, and truly real for our students. Um, and sure, sometimes I have students that uh, studied something in my class or, or developed a, a great list of, of people to learn with and learn from in an area of interest, they might put it down. Um, and that's okay. We just have to have the confidence to know that when they are ready, um, uh, to develop in whatever career or whatever civic engagement that they're interested in, or whatever academic pursuit they're interested in, that they know that this style of getting online as an active, informed citizen with a network that delivers quality information and curating a positive image uh, is the best way uh, uh, to, to learn about and show uh, that you're a learner and contributor in a space that will benefit you professionally, uh, personally, uh, or, 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 or perhaps, um, <clears throat> you know, it, it's something that would, that you can create that would, you can share with the world to make it a better place. That's the hope. Uh, and and I, I think I'll close by saying, you know, in, in summary, we don't have to succeed with every kid. Every kid doesn't have to love whatever subject you're teaching them. Um, but we do have to help them figure out that there are networks uh, where they can learn from experts in the same way that there are social media places where they can hang out with friends. Um, and there is a, a time when you should be, you know, building up a, a beautiful digital portfolio as a professional or as a learner, uh, as an academic. Uh, and there's times when you want to be able to, to, you know, make memes and, and connect with, with your friends. And there's time when you want to be consuming, where you're really learning something about something that you care about and you're truly challenging yourself and, and, and stimulating the brain. Uh, and there are times when you can just, you know, get on Hulu and, and just, you know, veg out. Uh, and finally, there are times when you should be, you know, creating and, and, and creating original content, showing proof of work uh, to prove that you're a learner and a contributor to these spaces. And there are times when you can just be scrolling and learning uh, and that all of that is totally fine. But the question for us is what's the ratio here of how often they're doing those green things to how often they're doing those red things? Um, and it doesn't even have to be 50-50. Um, but we have got to do a better job increasing some of those uh, the time that our students are spending in uh, networks with experts where they're uh, uh, consuming, you know, curating a professional image or, or a quality uh, image that they'd be proud of. Uh, uh, and they're learning and creating and collaborating. And I think we can increase uh, that time, but only if we teach in social media spaces and we allow students to follow uh, and learn about their passions. Um, thank you so much for your time today. I look forward to our Q&A session uh, for those that watch this and are, are joining me live. Um, I hope everyone is enjoying ASCD conference this year. Uh, please tweet at me or email me or anything like that if you have any questions. Thank you.